These are in listen only mode. Hi everyone, I'd like to welcome you to the webinar on SDGs and transformations, the man management challenge, where we'll be talking about what the relationship is between traditional measures such as national indices, log frames, results frameworks, and efficiency concepts with the complex quality of transformation. And this webinar is hosted by Future Earth. My name is Christina Cook and I'm based at Future Earth's Montreal hub. We're also supported by the SDG Transformation Forum, the Future Earth Transformation Knowledge Action Network, and Geneva 2030. And Future Earth is a platform to bring the knowledge and practice of sustainability science into the change processes of society. So many of you who are joining us today will have um, been with uh, Future Earth on, on the webinar before, but I'm going to make a few housekeeping notes. We'll be recording this webinar, so it'll be available online in the next day or two. There will be two or three presentations, sorry, there will be three presentations of, ten, of about 10 minutes, and the remaining time will be for a question and answer session. So if you have a question during the presentations, please type it into the, the question box on your screen. And as time allows, we'll work through the questions, and we'll try to even unmute your microphone and ask you to speak your question. If you're unable to use it, use your microphone, which sometimes happens, um, we'll read your question in and the panel will, will answer it. So I'd like to now pass the baton to Steve Waddell, who will chair the session today. Thanks, Steve. Thanks so much, Christina, and thank you for joining us today. Um, uh, the people we have today on this webinar as lead discussants are really quite remarkable. Um, they've all got a deep experience in both uh, measurement, analysis, uh, assessments, and the issue of transformation. So they're um, very active at the work in this field, as well as uh, being leaders in what I would call sort of the um, methodological and theoretical perspectives uh, that we're developing. So uh, I really look forward to hearing from all of them today. We will have uh, Eva Furman first, and Eva is working on the assessment of the SDGs. Um, she is, has an official capacity here and a team of people uh, that she's assembled to support this. Uh, she's also uh, working on new ways of thinking about the assessment of the SDGs and working, taking new initiatives in that direction. So um, she can please start. She's going to start by presenting both um, some perspectives about the historic what is happening and uh, some ideas about where we uh, want to go. So Eva, I would like to pass the baton to you now. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Can you see my screen now? We can indeed. And, and here as well? Yes, very yeah. good. Okay. So, so really exciting to be here with you. Uh, my name is Eva Furman. I, I work at the Finnish Environment Institute. <clears throat> and uh, as a director for a center for environmental policy. And uh, I have had a passion for sustainable development as the angle to environmental issues already for, for years. And uh, I've been active in this field. For example, I'm also chairing the uh, Finnish uh, Sustainable Development Advisory Board for the um, uh, commission that we have in Finland for sustainable development. And uh, the angle that I'm usually having for measuring things is more from the assessment and evaluation part and, and very much on ana analyzing real cases, analyzing experimentation and, and trying to funnel out from those uh, what are the enabling things and what are the uh, issues that cause friction and uh, i see very much the word uh, like the socio-ecological approach and an integrated uh, approach to the uh, global challenges and uh, i would like still to say that uh, i very much see that the world is very complex and therefore it is very messy and the problems are messy and, and we have to accept when we are solving them that they are messy and, and should uh, not uh, 
uh, aim for something perfect because the problems are not perfect and they are evolving all the time. So that was only my background. And now I'm going to say a few words from my um, perspective and I'll turn on the second slide, which shows the uh, United Nations system for science policy mechanism, uh, which is for, in a way, also we could call it measuring the uh, progress in sustainable development. And so uh, part of the Agenda 2030, a high level political forum has been formed and it meets again uh, in a couple of weeks time in New York in the UN headquarters. And one part of it is the uh, uh, global sustainable development report that will be written every fourth year. And I'm part of a group that is, is uh, now writing the report that should be finalized in 2019. So that's what I'm telling about. But there are many other issues as well. And one very interesting thing is the voluntary national reviews where the countries can really uh, tear with their own experiences, both challenges and successes with all other countries in the world. Well, uh, when we are looking at the uh, actual uh, uh, I have to a little bit move this on. So what we are looking for in our report is actually uh, some guidance on the state of uh, the global sustainable uh, development. And now we could ask, why don't we do any um, indicators? Well, indicators are done by the United Nations, but our group is focusing actually uh, on a deeper analysis. So we are looking what science says about the uh, success of the implementation and also what are the lessons learned and focusing on the challenges and, and trying to bring some emerging issues. And also take an integrated approach and examine the policy options. These are really crucial for the work that we are doing. And we are working on all different uh, di dimensions from global to, to country level. Uh, this, uh, these are the people who are writing the report with me. We are 15 and it's shared by Peter Messerli from Switzerland and Enda Murni Nuskovas from uh, Indonesia. And uh, we are representing very different uh, approaches to, to sustainable development, but all of us have experience from developing countries and from uh, interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research. Uh, this is the core of the report that we are writing, so we have divided it, in, it into four different sections. Uh, one is uh, uh, looking at the role of science, so we are really trying to see how science is used. Then we are also looking outside the box, which means that we look at issues that are not included. Either they are politically sensitive, or then only science knows about them, but not uh, the uh, political forum. Then there are lots of work done on interactions. And then there are the development pathways. And I think that's what is important in the meeting that we are having right now here, the webinar. So I focus on that, so the development pathways. And what are the issues that we are actually touching upon here uh, are uh, the following. Firstly, what we mean with pathways, and I think this is really crucial that uh, not everyone is actually dealing uh, with them at the same time. We are talking about transformations in this group, but at the same time we are talking about transition and pathways. So they are different ways. And so we bring the theoretical basis, but at the same time we uh, funnel it and, and, and try to uh, color it with experimentation and real world cases. We are looking at the potential and challenges of a systemic approach to deal with the sustainable development goals for building pathways. And also really importantly, look at the societal inclusiveness, because we see that this is very crucial when we are dealing with transition, to have the society in, involved in it. Um, so we see how that has 
occurred in different parts of the world, in different networks and, and in different countries. And then also whether it's the former steering multilateral uh, and other inter-country uh, mechanisms that are doing it, or are the informal governance uh, elements very important when we enhance transition? Uh, then fifthly, we are looking at the elements that are, um, actually enable uh, the pathways to build up for example, the local level niches, uh, how they are supported by institutional changes, and that again leading to regime shift. This very much comes from the transition uh, theory that's developed in, 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 in Europe very much. And then what kind of elements can cause the friction to pathways? So these are the ways that we, how we actually measure. Then finally, we look at the overall progress on it. Uh, I, I, I finalize with just saying that the report uh, is not going to be developed in four years, but in two years. We have unfortunately that little time. And the next, the, this year and the next year, 2018, are the very crucial ones. And we are very much interested in collaborating with others, both research and both the society in large with business and NGOs and, and so forth, the society. So thank you very much. This was my intervention here in the beginning, and I look forward to uh, your questions or comments on this. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Eva. Uh, just as a reminder to build on uh, Eva's request there, if you have questions or comments, please feel free to fill them in on the sidebar here. So that's a perspective on what is being done on pathways for the SDGs in particular. And we're now going to move on to Fred Carden. And Fred had a long history with the International Development Research Center in Canada. Um, I first got to know him because he was involved in developing the outcome mapping methodology that's used for I'm looking at large systems change and several networks I work with um, have explored and uh, used that type of methodology. Uh, Fred has been working independently around the world on some very interesting change projects and big transformation issues. And so he will be presenting some of his perspectives on transformation and the SDGs with measurement. Thanks so much, Fred. Welcome. Thanks very much, Steve. So as Steve said, I was at IDIC for about 20 years, but the last four years I've spent a fair bit of time in Indonesia. So I'm going to focus my remarks on, on the work in Indonesia. Uh, so the context I'm thinking about is national, but I think a lot of the issues I'm going to speak to speak to the SDGs as well, because we're really talking about a big, messy, wicked problem, which is the idea of evaluating a mental revolution. So to give you a bit of the context, uh, when President uh, Jokowi came to power in 2014 in Indonesia, he called for a mental revolution. And what he meant by that was a change in thinking and action to promote a strong democracy and an economy that's actually fit for the 21st century. Indonesia is one of the most populous countries in the world, as you probably know. It trans transitioned to democracy less than 20 years ago, and it faces a huge number of challenges this uneven and unequal development, a very weak educational system, a bureaucracy that tends to centralization, a lot of corruption, and significant levels of intolerance. But at the same time, it's also a country that's very rich in resources, in cultures, uh, in natural beauty, has a very resilient population, and has the potential to be one of the economic powerhouses of Asia. So the challenges are great and the priorities for a mental revolution are big ones. The kinds of priorities he called for were um, achieving economic independence, achieving a corruption-free state. So evaluating progress is no easy task on this front. And when I was asked to speak at a conference about the mental revolution, um, I, I spoke about some of the issues I'm gonna talk about here. And clearly indicators alone won't work for lots of reasons that I think hold for the SDGs. First of all, the data is either weak or non-existent uh, for most of the issues. The indicators tell you about the end state, not about the pathways as Eva was talking about. 
And finally, in a system, what happens is not a result of the parts of the system, but of their interactions. So it's in the arrows in all of our models that the real action is taking place. And that's what we need to understand. So in that sense, we're looking at behaviors and actions and activities that need to change for progress to be actually sustainable. And who has to do what differently from what they're doing now uh, in order to see progress? And how do we populate those arrows with the kind of actions and mechanisms that will support transformative change? So basing a bit on some of my previous work at IDRC to understand influence of, public, of research on public policy, I built a tentative framework for thinking about the question of how you evaluate a mental revolution. And the study found that once you know what you're trying to accomplish with your vision and your mission, a strong understanding of the context is essential. And it's not just the socio-political context, but also the decision context or the willingness and ability of the decision makers to actually promote change. Um, and those, these are really issues of identifying what in the environment you do not control, but that has a major impact on how you operate. The study then identified four main areas where uh, there are things that you do control, and that is the relationships, the networks, the communications, and the institution building or institutional understanding, which is really about the question of is what you are proposing actionable? So how effective the proponents of change were at establishing the right relationships to strengthen what kinds of networks and coalitions to build with their allies, how well they communicated to supporters, to opponents and to policymakers, and how well they understood how the change would fit in the institutional and organizational context in which they were operating, were the real keys to successful efforts to influence public policy. And in many of the 23 cases, the, uh, the way the factors interacted was, was often quite different. Uh, in some settings, it was about policy researchers engaging directly with politicians and the opposition parties. In others, it was engaging with communities to create that influence. Uh, and in others, it was building primarily about building coalitions with advocacy organizations and advocacy groups. But in each case, the factors combined to a greater or lesser extent uh, to suit the context that was at play. And in each of them, several things were going on that were central to transformation. One was targeting the right people in the right organizations and at the right levels of those organizations, because it's not always the top of the system that is the most effective. Uh, maintaining a very high quality of work, a high standard of operation, maintaining consistency approach, and finally being deliberate. We can then define progress through what changes in behaviors, actions, or activities take place. And we do this in a bit of, in a progressive way, which emerges from outcome mapping, which Steve mentioned earlier. Uh, what will happen if the key players uh, respond to your interventions, that they take a, a tentative first steps? Then what happens if they become more active in the transformation process and start seeking advice and help? And then what, what changes will there be in their behaviors and their actions if they begin to lead the process and use you as technical backup and support? Because in the end, it is the, as evaluators, we are agents of change, but we're not making the change ourselves. It is the people who create in those national and international institutions who help end global, po global poverty, improve education, and all of the other issues uh, and goals in the Sustainable Development Goals. So in that sense, what I'm looking at is trying to figure out how evaluation supports them in achieving their goals, not just telling them whether they got there or not. And the point here, I think, is that change does not happen all at once. So we need to theorize how we think it will unfold, track that, learn, and modify our course of action over time. And in, in a nutshell, that's what I've been working on, trying to understand how to measure transformation in that way. It's a highly adaptive approach. And one of the things Steve said was, what are the challenges you're still facing? To speak briefly to that. Um, I'm still struggling with how to persuade funders to be truly adaptive in their processes. There's a lot more conversation about doing development differently. Uh, so at least the conversation is going in the right direction. But as long as the contracts continue to measure uh, against outcomes that are set two, two to five years in advance, um, it's going to be very difficult to make the case uh, for continuous adaptation and to make the, the, the quick moves that you often need to make. 
The second challenge that I face is time. It's a challenge that everyone faces. How, you, how do you develop a synthetic thinking approach in a relatively light way while also remembering that learning and reflection take time. And if we don't build that time in, we're not so likely to learn and not so likely to be able to strengthen our theories and our practice. Thank you. So much for it. Um, that question around how do we build in time and learning is one that resonates strongly with me. We're so often focused upon um, the product uh, that the actual reflections are not always supported, the time it takes for doing that. Um, our next speaker is uh, well known in this field as well, Michael Quinn Patton. He's had a high profile in leading some new development methodologies. Uh, in particular, I associate Michael with a developmental evaluation simply because it was very influential in the way I thought about development or evaluation with respect to transformation, multi-methodological, multidisciplinary, uh, working over uh, periods of time and how to integrate that. Um, today, Michael's taking on this question of global systems evaluation. Uh, and we're welcoming him here to be able to share some of the new directions he's taking now. Thank you so much, Michael, for joining us. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks to Future Earth for hosting this along with the other sponsors. It's certainly important work, uh, and I'm pleased to be a, a part of it. Um, Fred was talking about um, mental uh, changes and mental revolution, and a part of what I want to suggest is that the uh, as important as the SDGs are, and they will continue to play a major role, um, they remain based on the, a nation state model um, and uh, inherently on indicators. Uh, and, and the measurement piece of that gets defined around the indicators. Um, and yet, when we look at the major kind of challenges that the world is facing, none of those are nation state based and they can't be solved at a nation state level. Um, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Burkina Faso in the 1960s working in agriculture. And as a young man, uh, without perspectives on how things work or mental models about it, I simply observed that, that agriculture and food, land and the environment, water, disease, education, climate, income, standards of living were all interconnected. Um, people lived in villages in holistic systems, affected by the larger systems around them, the colonial system, the global system, uh, economic, the multinational capitalist system, and government competitions among ideologies. Um, and, and so, we continue uh, as a matter of, of manageability, I think, and planning systems to fall back on silos like the SDGs and, and linear models of change and, and standardized kinds of indicators, um, none of which are transformational. In fact, it's transforming those systems of evaluation that will be part of transformation itself. So the blue marble perspective um, is a perspective of the earth as a whole uh, without regard to nation state boundaries or national level indicators. It means working at a transnational level, um, the integration across silos, not only of the SDGs, but of other patterns of change that are going on, connecting local and global. Um, and thinking about the globe uh, as a integrated system where these interactions uh, very much affect each other. Uh, the, the language of measurement itself is, is problematic in this regard. That's the second point I wanna make. The first is changing what we call an evaluation, the unit of analysis from the nation state to the globe from silos to across silos, integrated systems. The second point I would make is that the language of, of measurement itself um, 
leads people down a pathway of operationalization of high degree of specification, um, which in a dynamic, highly turbulent, uncertain global system is actually distorting. Um, the alternative is to treat something like transformation as a sensitizing concept that we interact around that's going to be uh, meaningful contextually and has to be interpreted contextually and dynamically. But I find a lot of, of, of the work ends up getting stymied with people searching for an operational definition of, uh, of, of transformation. Let me illustrate the difference between operationalization and a sensitizing concept, which is a, a, a concept that, that is a container for dialogue and interaction, but doesn't need to and can't be defined in operational terms. And to try to do so is distorted. So we can define what a rose is in the taxonomic system of plants. We can define a rose, but we can't define what a garden is. A garden is highly contextual and variable. We can define water um, chemically, but we can't define a watershed absolutely because it depends upon the purpose of that particular framing. Um, we can define what a human being is uh, taxonomically, but we can't define what a family is. A family is a sensitizing concept. A garden is a sensitizing concept. Transformation is a sensitizing concept. And so part of the issue is doing the engagement around um, that very notion that is not subject to narrow measurement or narrow operationalization. Um, and indeed, the very notion of transformation suggests a scale of change and a speed of change that would be beyond anything that we could operationalize in a meaningful way. The uh, distinguished statistician Fred Mosteller talked about interocular significance as opposed to statistical significance. Interocular significance is significance that hits you between the eyes. If you're having to run significance tests to tell whether or not there's been significant change, there hasn't been. If there's going to be transformational change, we're going to know that it's happening. The problem is not the measurement of it. The problem is, is actually engaging with uh, multiple perspectives, uh, multiple kinds of, of data, qualitative and quantitative and case and indicators and cross-national in an integrated systemic synthesis way to understand what the global patterns are. Which means my third point is the problem is less one of, uh, of measurement. I don't think measurement's a, a challenge at all. It's, it's the sense-making process that is the challenge, how to, how to make meaning of, of the data. The world is awash in data. There's not a data shortage. Um, what's in, in short supply is our system's complexity understandings of how to make sense of what's going on. A fourth point, that I would make is um, that how we engage in evaluation of transformation is part of the change process. Uh, that what we call process use in evaluation is the very effect of evaluating something changes the system. The, so the kinds of con concepts that we bring to evaluation, whether it's operationalization and logical frameworks and SDGs and indicators, or whether it's a global systems change, sensitizing concepts, highly dynamic, interactive, complex uh, sense of, of meaning making, that affects the nature of the process itself. It affects the vision that Fred talked about. It affects the engagement. My final point is the that while SDGs are part of the global context now, there's a lot of resources pouring into them, they're going to be important, they're not the whole picture. Um, nor is all the focus on intentional change, um, interventions, um, pathways of change. In fact, globalization supersedes intentionality. The great systems changes of the past, the transformations of history, have not been led by plans and frameworks and pathways. Uh, they're led by larger kind of systems uh, of, of the world as it unfolds. 
and that, that much of what we're missing in the real world dynamics of complexity, we miss because we're so narrowly focused on those things that we can define, that we operationalize, that we determine pathways around, that we try to act upon. And so a part of global systems evaluation has to be looking at the larger patterns of change that are unfolding natu naturally. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Michael. Uh, so very interesting that you bring up, uh, again, people, uh, please feel free to put your questions into the uh, question box on the left-hand side. Um, the thing that strikes me is the challenge of being and becoming is one of my history uh, faculty members, uh, professors taught about, or um, the concept of uh, ambidexterity, um, that we have this expectation rooted in the historic view of what measurement is about, and yet we've got to uh, develop this new way of looking at it. Um, Eva, you're really limited by what you can do by uh, the expectations of using uh, national level indicator or national level research for some of your reports, and you're yet figuring this way out of being able to go beyond that by doing some more case study work and looking at uh, developing the concept of pathways. Um, Fred, you're really challenging people on how they think about these issues and realizing that our uh, mental models are part of the uh, big challenge here. And Michael, you've really brought this all together with uh, the questions, the four questions that uh, comments that you uh, particularly raised. And uh, how we engage with transformation is part of the transformation process. So how we engage in uh, measurement and assessment is part of the change process for measurement and assessment itself. I'm just wondering if uh, you have any comments, uh, the three of you, about this. How do we actually both uh, respond to people's uh, current um, place where they are in the way they and the systems we have for gathering data and thinking about this and build the new uh, ways of supporting transformation in the creative complexity that we're talking about here. Um, it, parallel process demands here. Um, any thoughts from the three of you? Uh, shall I start? Please go ahead, Eva. Yeah, so, so something that uh, really come up in, in my mind from all, all the three of us uh, is very much that uh, it's, it's both the outputs and, and the concrete things that you can see in the change, but it's also the process that includes the um, engagement that are very important. And, and the, the whole point in, in trying to measure is that you measure with several different ways the change all the time, the transition or the transformation, whatever you call it, that you uh, measure it with different uh, uh, methods. And, and in a way, from that, try to ex extrapolate out what are the um, kind of... Uh, steps, whether they are going to the right direction or, or whether they uh, are actually not uh, making any, any real change. So using a broad palette of methods is, is very important. And what I mentioned earlier is this acceptance of uh, messiness, which means actually that you see all the time uh, both positive and negative and you see different kind of paths there is not only one path that leads us to in a way to the right direction there are several paths and and we can only give estimations on, on or assessments which might be the ones that lead us to the right direction and which ones are the ones that we should really avoid i don't know if this helped at all <laughs> thank you um, I, I guess I, I would say first, I really like the 
the phrase from Michael that uh, transformation exceeds intentionality. And I think that's right because, and I think if I think about my case in Indonesia, you'll know when you're reaching a corruption-free state uh, or not. I mean, people will know that. There's no need to measure that per se. Um, at the same time, I think what we have to try to do is say, if we are trying to actually intervene in a system and create change, we need to understand the processes that are going on and if we're moving in the direction we want to go. So I think it's much more useful to be evaluating at that level uh, and using the, the tools of evaluation, and as Ava said, a variety of tools, to, to look at what interventions we do try to create and to look at them more broadly than in the intervention itself. So it's not just about the intervention, but it's also about what's going on around that intervention uh, and whether or not it is actually moving you closer to your goal. I, I can, am partly concerned that the very nature of most evaluation because of the nature of planning processes and budgeting processes is incrementalist inherently and is relatively slow and that one of the things that I think we we have to get better at and anticipate given the scenarios about our future is that we're not going to very long be able to deal with the longer term plan for transformation because we're going to be in and may already be in a global crisis and so the the way in which you evaluate response to crisis is a completely different frame than the way in which you uh, uh, evaluate intentional change. I was recently at the, the International Dialogue of the Global Alliance for the Future of Food where they were discussing the latest climate change data. And of course, there are various kinds of projections, but this was a pretty sober group um, of people, it included scientists and people working at the grassroots and the projections that were that were most commonly i think accepted among this fairly large group out of the dialogue was something like the following that by 2050 we're likely to lose 20 countries 60 cities and 1.5 billion people displaced that's a scenario of scale of change, of speed of change, that throws everything into transformation. And we're going to have to be able to be nimble and agile and rapid response and help people deal with, with interventions in real time under a crisis environment. That's our future. Um, so at least some of us have to be planning for that future while the others are going about business as usual thinking we have time. Mm. Thanks so much. Uh, your comments, Michael, uh, resonate with some of my concerns as well, that we're indeed um, going to have transformation forced upon us. <laughs> it's not going to be this uh, process that we have a choice about, right? Uh, so how do we uh, think about it in that context as well? We have some uh, questions from the people who are attending. And I would like, if possible, to get them to use their microphones. I'm thinking I see a couple of comments here from Henrik Goodmanson. And perhaps, Henrik, you could unmute your microphone and share with us some of your questions and thoughts about this. Please go ahead. Oh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Am I audible? OK, thank you. Uh, this is very, very interesting. I just had uh, just one quick question for Eva, uh, mentioning the work of the Commission, whether uh, the scope will also extend beyond global and national to urban level and, and challenges uh, facing cities as drivers for sustainable development. That was the first question. And the second was more like a, a reflection on Michael's intervention, because I was just wondering who is actually able to act on this complexity that you outlined so rightly. I mean, is indicators and reducing complexity always bad, or do we not sometimes need more incremental measures of progress? Okay, should I start? Okay, thank you. Very interesting yeah, question. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, start with the city issue. So as we, as we all know, cities are the places where 
uh, we have um, a big uh, challenge for sustainability and then on the other hand they are the places where you can really make fast transition because they are areas which are which are under high dynamic so it definitely will be but as as you notice the structure is not made uh, upon different habitats or different uh, context it's more uh, the starting point is is more like the uh, issues or, or the kind of topics of uh, sustainability so we are we are working on pathways and not on cities but definitely cities are going to be a great part of it and this links very much with the habitat which was the other united nations process that was only half year earlier than than uh, our group was started last was it september in in quito there was a big uh, fest uh, venue on on uh, urban sustainability and for example the Finnish sustainable development strategy uh, actually includes uh, urban mm, as a special issue so it's it's included in the UN and and uh, you said about the EC which is the European Commission so there actually the urban issues are, are very high on the agenda and actually this week there will be uh, a lot of discussions on, on, on urban sustainability and, and they very much look at it from the perspective of, of SDGs. Thank you. Thanks so much, Eva. Um, Fred, I'm just thinking in the model that you shared, um, there would be a temptation by some to see it as a linear model. Um, because you start from the left and move to the right. And yet, of course, uh, you're very much a systems thinker, so all these things are um, interacting at the same time. I'm wondering how uh, we connect the micro, which is all these things interacting at the same time, with the macro, which is how we actually see the trends over time, um, so that we create a, a process of becoming sensitive to trends but we also uh, give some sort of uh, indicators on a smaller level of when we're moving in the right direction thanks um there was a question for michael in there as well so i hope you get back to that one um previously but um the problem with um two-dimensional paper and surfaces is that models tend to look linear um, either you make a model that has a lot of arrows and connections and, and begins to look very messy and hard to read, or you develop something that has a tendency to look linear. Um, but I think the, the thinking here was that you're going from your high level vision of what, what, what's, the, what's the vision you have for the future down to what, what is the piece that we can actually work on? Um, and how do we understand how that micro intervention fits with the macro and you're always going back and forth between the two there's never uh, you're never buried just in the micro intervention you're thinking about the macro as well um, and always going back and forth and testing whether or not you think you're making a positive contribution or not and if you're not then you think about how do you change that contribution and that's where i was saying that i think uh, one of the big challenges is the inability of systems to adapt unless there is actually a crisis and then the systems can adapt more quickly or try to at that stage. Uh, but how do we, uh, and this is really comes back to, I guess, the question for Michael, which is around how do we actually think at that level and actually create the opportunities and the support systems for that macro level work and that macro level thinking. Mm -hmm. So let's turn to Michael. The, the closest to a way of dealing with this that, that I've seen would be inspired by the way that the U.S. Federal Reserve operates. Um, when Alan Greenspan, who was chair of the U.S. Federal Reserve for 20 years, retired, he gave his uh, final speech at Jackson Hole, Wyoming, where the world central bankers gather every year. He could have spoken about anything, 
you know, huge experience on, on dealing with the world economy and the US economy for 20 years. What he spoke on, and you can search this online and read it, was urging central bankers not to set targets because the world's economic system is too complex. And that when you set targets and begin to try to manage around targets, you distort the rest of the system in unknown ways. So what the Federal Reserve does is they have virtually unlimited resources and data and people monitoring at the micro level, micro not just in space, but micro in time. Micro and macro can also be applied to time, short time periods and long time periods. And they have a, their, their governors, um, the economists from around the United States, um, meet every six weeks with their staffs and say, what's happening to the various things we're tracking? What's happening with the quantitative data in different parts of the world? Is there a currency crisis someplace? Is there a political crisis someplace? Is there an environmental crisis someplace? How's that affecting the economy? Uh, how, and, and they look at the interrelationships among both quantitative and qualitative data. Um, and every six weeks, decide whether or not there's something they ought to be doing or what indicators to pay more attention to, what data to pay more attention to going forward. And they're constantly adapting, looking at the system, uh, both in terms of, of the, the stability within some boundaries of the entire world economic system. Um, and of course, they sometimes get it wrong. I mean, it turns out that in 2008, the world economic system almost did come down. And nobody understood what was going on and all they knew to do was keep pouring money in because the understanding was if it stopped nobody knew how to get it started again um, but we really were if you go back and read about that time hanging by a thread that what that what that means is atms don't work checks can't be written there are no ways of transferring money to people um, we got close to that system completely collapsing so what we what what it seems to me the way we manage evaluatively um, and uh, interventionlessly in a global complex system would be to have such a entity of, of people from different parts of the world and different perspectives and different scientific backgrounds who are on an ongoing basis monitoring what's happening at a global system and independently being able to say here are the ways that the global system is unfolding, the threats to that, and possible actions to take. Mm. Well, it reminds me of the importance of being humble in <laughs> any of our work in transformation, and also of the danger of thinking what works at a nor for an organization like a business in terms of the way it works, uh, applying that to a complex system um, that uh, is, uh, well, uh, some of the organizations are certainly of the size of complex systems, but we've simply taken our sort of accounting models from small businesses and sort of uh, blown them up and think that's the way we should be um, organizing uh, the, the general assessment frame sometimes, I think. Um, we have a question, another question for Eva from uh, Andre Mascarenhas. And Andre, again, I'm wondering if you might be able to unmute your microphone and pose your question for uh, Eva. Are you there, Andre? Otherwise, I can uh, read the question um, fine as well. Oh, there you are. Okay, thank you everyone for Yes, we can hear you now. Um, my question to Eva was if you could give some more details on the process you mentioned that you have envisioned to integrate the views of uh, different stakeholders into the reports you are preparing. So the question would be where or, or how can people know uh, when and how they can contribute to those to those reports. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's a very relevant question, or a very practical one compared to what we have been talking about here. So <clears throat> the group uh, that I represent, we are only 15, so the whole work is done by uh, allying with different kind of networks. And uh, 
we are at the moment actually uh, searching networks for this purpose and and one of the ways of doing that is this webinar so any anyone interested in in uh, contributing one way or the other could uh, contact for example me by email and and then i can um, advise further but we are not going to uh, have uh, so many uh, interventions from private persons but from mainly from networks and uh, we are looking for contributions of writing uh, let's say six pages of something that is really relevant for our report and then uh, we would collaborate with these uh, networks or people who are writing uh, certain uh, yeah, we, we call them, for example, synthesis papers of a certain issue that is relevant and, and they need to link with the work that we are doing, uh, the four different chapters that we are having. But uh, instead of sending us something uh, ready-made, uh, it would be really important to negotiate with us and then we can tell whether it is worthwhile. Uh, collaborating on, on on this but that's basically the way so we are not going to have a uh, open website where anyone can contribute with anything but we are really uh, pinpointing what we need and from whom so that's the way and then we are also organizing these different kind of workshops on the different topics already this year and about the time schedule, so uh, I would say that it will be autumn and then next spring when we can uh, take in uh, the kind of contributions that I mentioned. So, so that's that's the way. So if you are interested or you know some some uh, networks that are working uh, on on these four topics that I mentioned, uh, it would be really nice if you could contact me. And um, I don't know how my email can be found. Maybe Steve and Steve, do you share our? Oh, it's a, at least it's on my slides that will be open for everyone. There you have my uh, email address. You can, you. you can type your email right in the uh, chat box, Eva, if and share it with people there if you'd like to do that. Thank you. I'd like to uh, give chance for Tarang Singh to also pose the question for Michael around the Blue Marble perspective. Tarang, can you uh, unmute your microphone and join us? Um, yeah, yeah, hi. There you are. Uh, okay, so uh, my question is, while the Blue Marble perspective works when you try and imagine uh, social and also environmental transformation, um, I feel like there are a lot of political and also social identities that are always at play when we try and imagine what development should look like, say, for a nation or for an Indian citizen like myself. So how do we reconcile the enormity of global processes or, say, teleconnections with specific data and situations? And oftentimes those situations are quite dire that we see around us. Thank you. It's a, it's a great question. And, and um, I think that that in fact part of what i was suggesting is that that these kind of political dynamics are not something anybody's in control of um, and therefore they are part of the context that we have to to monitor and take into account that is uh, rapidly changing it's not that that they are far from static and that they are affecting what's going on the the example i gave of of having an independent group of people with different perspectives and different backgrounds being able to assess the implications of these dynamics, both short term and longer term. We get distracted by momentary crises that often end up not being very significant and miss the bigger picture of things or paying attention to the bigger picture end up not paying attention to um, the humanitarian crisis in Darfur. Um, and so the interrelationship of these things politically uh, is part of the challenge of our time and it's one of the reasons why country level measurement is not going to be sufficient to give us the story of geopolitics, of the multinational capitalist economy that's largely invisible to people but directs a great deal of what goes on. The huge wealth disparities that we're dealing with are not 
at the programmatic or World Bank level, they're at the private sector level. Um, and so there are all these other kind of things that need to be exposed and paid attention to and taken into account, not in a we're going to control them way, but in a responsive, adaptable way. And partly it's getting uh, a better transparency around how the global system actually works. Because my sense is there's a whole lot of stuff um, in the shadows that we actually don't know very much about. And occasionally in something like the 2008 crisis, we find out we get windows into that world, but we're mainly shut out from it. We go about our sort of plans and, and initiatives, and it's really a very small piece of these larger forces going on. So part of what we can do is push for greater transparency uh, of what's really going on in the global scene. Um, and stuff that we don't know about that's affecting what gets done. Thank you. Um, I'd like to just suggest that we go around and get final thoughts about this challenge of, uh, we've posed here of uh, transformation and how to think about it for people who are dealing with measurement and how we, uh, what your closing thoughts would be. I guess uh, my closing thought is not that profound, but it's about the enormity of the challenge and yet about the crisis that we're facing. And I always feel like it's odd when I talk about crisis and say it in a calm world word, because I think I should be shouting about it or something that we've got to do this much better because there's these crises which are unfolding. And so let's work on this more intensely. Um, but anyways, that might not be uh, the most productive of uh, reactions, but um, maybe we could just go around and have some final comments. Um, Eva, would you have some final reflections? Okay, thank you. Yeah, firstly, I would like to say about the crisis. I also believe before that the crises are the ones that really activate people and so forth. That's not the case. The problem is that the crises are actually so local. Uh, either they are local or then they take place in such a uh, slow um, way that actually uh, that does not really um, make people into into action and and I, I very much believe in this inclusiveness and in the experimentation on, on local level the nation level uh, experimentation and, and uh, trying new things on local level and then rather trying to find support for that from the institutional level and have, have these two uh, elements uh, uh, linked with each other and build networks, networks of people uh, across the societies uh, uh, from local level to global level, different kind of networks where you learn from each other. So uh, I'm, I'm a, a bit worried about the thing that we talk very much about the crisis because crises unfortunately are, are slow and, and many many times if they are fast then they are local uh, i would also like to say a few words about indicators as measurement of uh, transition we haven't talked about that yet and the problem with indicators is that usually the uh, uh, key changes that are happening in societies are something that are surprises and so very seldom the indicators are actually catching those. The indicators are very good at following whether those who are committed are really doing their job. But to really see if there is transition taking place, the indicators are not necessarily the best ones. And therefore, we need to work the, the other way around and, and see the different arrows going to different directions and try to figure out from those whether it's going the right way. And I would like to finalize by saying that experimentation with goodwill does not necessarily mean that it's going to the right direction from the sustainability per perspective and therefore also the kind of uh, solid uh, evaluation and assessment of the experimentation of goodwill is really important to cut down those experimentations that are not really leading uh, the direction to the right right direction so i i think i'll stop here <laughs> thank you
Steve, you're muted. Final thoughts from you, Fred. <laughs> okay, thanks, Steve. Um, not a lot to add, really. I mean, it, networks are crucial, and I think networks that, that take a global perspective are really important. I think we need to build those, because I think that's where you can begin to get some of the political pressures. At the same time, I think we have to find opportunities for action. Those are often local, not always. Uh, but I think we have to seize those moments and we have to have ways to look at them and figure out, are we actually going in the right direction or not? Are we, are we contributing positively to the kind of change? So it's the, it's the process evaluation. It's looking a lot at um, what, what's being done differently now than, than, than it was being done before. Um, so taking those local opportunities for action. I think my examples in Indonesia are that the education system is a disaster and using evidence for public policy is extremely difficult. Um, but you can't deal with that all at once. Uh, you can deal with it on issues where you can get traction, like changing the procurement legislation for procuring research, for example, or getting the creation of an Indonesian science fund that can actually then fund a proper research. Um, so finding places where you can take action uh, at whatever level you can work at, I think is a crucial part of the equation, along with building those networks to put pressure for transparency. Thank you. And Michael. Uh, oh, yep. I, I, to be provocative, would suggest that um, transformation and measurement are oxymoronic terms. That um, uh, transformation, if we take it seriously as a sensitizing concept, supersedes measurement. That the language of measurement in a transformation context is anachronistic. It evokes operationalization and narrow indicators and silos, which is actually counterproductive. And the transformation, by its very connotation, uh, suggests major uh, and rapid change that requires multiple kinds of data. Uh, an evaluative sense-making framework, and within that context, um, part of the transformation would be to abandon the language of measurement because it is anachronistic in this context, in my view. Thanks so much for that provo provocation. Um, I'd just like to finish by thanking everyone for uh, joining us. We will be, I've just put our emails, the one for Eva, so she can be contacted if you have further questions. I'm sorry we didn't get around to all of your questions, but I would like to also thank you for uh, joining us today, but think that uh, we will be having more webinars in the fall. It will be starting the week of September 11th. Well, it's the fall for us here in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, so, uh, very contextual perspective. If you would like to suggest anything for these webinars or some ideas or people that you would like to have join us, feel free to use my email there, Waddell, to comment about the webinars. And we'd like to broaden the engagement for these webinars, which are bringing uh, to you uh, great people and some of the critical transformational issues. With that, I'd like to say thank you. And Christina, do you have any final comments? Well, thanks everyone for attending. Um, I'll remind you that you'll get an email in the next day or two with a link to the webinar recording and slides will be on the website in the next day or two. And look, we look forward to, to hosting you again in the autumn of 2017. Thank you. Thank you, goodbye.